15. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 15 Patreon subscribers away from achieving this goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you can help keep Fishing the DMV alive. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You will also get 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, our newest sponsor who won best in show at the Richmond Expo. You'll also be a part of our private Facebook group community, weekly prize giveaways, and so much more. If you would like to support our show, check out our Patreon link down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. <sighs> Guys, uh, this this show has been absolutely fun. We're here finishing up our, our sh live coverage of the Dale City Fishing Expo. Um, this thing will, of course, be re-uploaded as a separate podcast episode. This is a guy that I've wanted to get on again. Um, I mean, the man, the myth, the legend, you know, Charlie Taylor. Sir, this is a amazing show that you guys put on here um hopefully it was a good turnout for you we had a very good turnout and it was a buying crowd which is great for our kids mm -hmm. since all profits go to the kids derby that that derby you put on has helped so many people it's absolutely amazing that it's been going on for so long 33 years <laughs> that's, in, that's crazy and still going we're we're just recovering from the COVID era mm. when we couldn't have it during that time, but it's coming back. Hopefully, we can back up to our two hundred and fifty or three hundred kids this year. That's insane. That's absolutely <laughs> insane. Do you have any memories from that the Derby that really stick out to you in your mind with all the ones that you've put on? Do I have any memory of which 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 derbies? <laughs> do any derbies stick out in your mind that you remember? Yes, a number of them. <laughs> Back before they redid Lake Fairfax, uh, they had a, a small one-story building there uh, with just a little cover over it. And it started raining. And all of the parents were all concerned. The kids were just as happy as they could be. 150 kids, none of them wanted to go home. When the parents wanted to drag them, they were crying. So all of a sudden, all of the kids stayed. It convinced their parents to let them stay. Since then, every time it's rained, we tell the parents, rain or shine, and we never have any problems. <laughs> it, it's just great. A Couple of other times, one, I guess the number one outstanding was the year a 10-year-old girl won the total. You're kidding. She was a little blonde, uh, freckle-faced little girl, had a beautiful smile. And that particular derby, we had Jim Vance from WTOP. TV anchor as the guest who presented the prizes and he put the little girl and her parents on the news that night for all of Northern Virginia on WTOP TV. Wow. Oh, that's such a great just story. A fantastic thing. How did you ever, and, and maybe I asked you this before and I apologize, how did you get with Lake Fairfax? How did that relationship happen? Uh, we actually didn't start off at Lake Fairfax. Oh, right. We started off at, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but out in between Sterling and Ashburn, there's a Verizon building, commercial building. Okay. And <laughs> our club was asked to stock the pond in front of their building. So hmm. one of our tournaments, we took our, our, catch in aerated live wells and took them out to the pond and stocked the pond. 
That's one way to do it. Yeah. Uh, then let's see. After that, that only lasted one year. Then we went to, I think, South Lake in Reston and fished there for two years. And then we lost that as well. The Reston mm -hmm. Association asked us to no more. <laughs> so we ended up at Lake Fairfax. And we just went in and asked them. Mm. I, I am not, I'm, I'm not great on saying this can't happen. Uh, I remember one time the, uh, the benefit tournament for St. Jude's Hospital hmm. was being held on the Potomac. And I knew that Jimmy Houston was always a participant in that. So I called a friend who I know was a good friend of Jimmy Houston and asked him if we could get Jimmy Houston to stop by the kids' derby and talk to him. And he said, no, he, he's, he's too busy. He'll never be able to do it. And I said, well, I understand that perfectly, but just in case, yeah. could we ask him? Jimmy Houston came to the show, and in, or the uh, derby, and instead of staying an hour, he stayed four hours. Wow. It's just unbelievable. Super, super guy. All the kids were thrilled, and the parents were even more thrilled, <laughs> particularly the guys. That's so cool. You're right, because you never know until you ask. Right. Like, I, I used to call uh, the Washington Redskins, and I had many Redskins out at the derbies. Uh, we have DC United people out there. There was one particular news anchor I wanted on, but I was never able to get her. <laughs> I forgot her name at the moment. It's been a while. You, um, we, I think we, we talked maybe off air one time about your relationship with Lake Manassas and stuff. Oh, yes. I, is it true that did you get in a little trouble with some people, I guess, with uh, your coverage of that place? Yes, I was. I received a phone call. I, I used to do a fishing report for all of the public bodies of water in the state of Virginia um, every week. And I had reporters all over the state that would call me with fishing reports and I would digest them and, and edit them and put them in the report. And one particular day, I got a call while I was on the water guiding from the mayor of Manassas, who told me that if he ever saw a report, fishing report on Lake Manassas again under my byline, that he would have me locked up for trespassing. Why? Because at the time, it was illegal for anyone to fish on Lake Manassas. Mm. Uh, they just, they closed the lake because it was Manassas water supply and they were afraid of terrorism, somebody putting poison in the lake. So now they pay $90,000 a year for police to ride around on the lake and keep people off it. That is the most, you can't make that up. And it, it is uh. probably the best fishing lake in Northern Virginia. Wow. Um, do you, do you have any, like, have you ever fished? Did you used to fish it ever? Absolutely. Used to have a, uh, a tournament every Wednesday night, night tournament would start at six o'clock in the evening and end at midnight. And it, it was a pop type tournament. You know, you would enter it X number of dollars and the, uh, the winner, the, the angler who brought in the largest bass won the pot. Wow. And the largest catfish won the pot. Unless the largest bass was bigger than the catfish. And in that case, he got all of it. <laughs> Well, I had the lake record for a catfish at one time. 
And my partner had the lake record for walleye. He had a nine and an eight. Dang. Both on the same night. That's crazy. Along with a six and a half pound bass. <laughs> That's a lot in that lake. I didn't realize that lake was so good. I can't... Oh, that lake was super. It was no problem at all to catch a limit of bass in a hundred yards on a buzz bait. Wow. Uh, I fished a lake, I think, four years before I ever bothered to turn on the depth finder on my, boat, my uh, John boat. And the day I turned it on, I found an underwater forest. <laughs> really? Wow. Trees growing off the bottom five feet under the surface of the lake. That's insane. I didn't know they were there. I started fishing there. It was right at the entrance to the canal where the uh, boat launch ramp was. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. That's but so freaking cool. Like crappy. Oh, huge oh, really? crappy in there. Beautiful, beautiful lake. What? Lake Brittle. That was a place that my aunt, Aunt Vicky, she used to take me when I was a kid. We go catfishing and stuff. Right. And that place has gotten so developed. Yes, it, it has. Have you ever heard from it in, in the last couple of years? Is it still have fish in it? Or is yes. It, it does? There are still fish in it. It, it is clear in the down lake areas. And you have an awful lot of slop on the bottom of mm. it. Uh, the, the black algae that gets all over your baits. But there are good fish coming out of there. Walleye, bass, and uh, at one point, big pickerel. Wow, I didn't know that. No, I haven't heard anything about the pickerel recently. Mm -hmm. But I don't get a lot of reports anymore <laughs> since I've shut down my fishing report. Yeah, I remember listen, uh, reading that report. Um, and there's the coverage you had. How did you get... Was it just you get one person to go to one lake? Did you drive around to every single lake to get the reports? Or did no, you? It, from fishing with the various clubs that I started <laughs> over the years, I would meet people at the ramp who fished there on, uh, you know, two or three times a week. And I would ask them if they would mind ask, uh, just calling me with a report. Uh, this was before big time internet usage <laughs> so everything was by telephone within but I, I just developed a list of anglers who fish those bodies of water two or three times a week and i used them rather than guides and tackle shops because they really didn't care whether you fish that body of water or not in fact they prefer it if you didn't <laughs> mm -hmm. so they told the truth if the fishing was bad, they told me it was bad. And I published it that way. If they said the fishing is good, so be it. But I stayed away from specific baits because when you deal with guides and tackle shops, in a lot of cases, they're gonna put you on to whatever is stocked in their back room that they can't sell. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's so freaking true. That's been crazy how much that's changed over the years. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the uh, one reply I got from a gentleman who was an employee of some big company in like Lynchburg. And he said he kept reading my report and he had never seen a report that worked out almost perfectly with his success. And he said, as a result, he started posting my fishing report on the bulletin board of the factory. He said, there's 300 people reading that report every day. <laughs> That's insane. What was your, for people that don't know, like what was your experience in writing before you got into the fishing report? Uh, I was guiding on the Potomac River, both upper and lower. And I had a, a call from a gentleman who asked me if I minded taking out older people. I said, no, no problem. He said, 
could you meet me at such and such a place, a gas station where I'm taking my car to have it repaired? I said, no problem. So I showed up and met him that day and we were going out on the upper Potomac out of Algonquian Regional Park. And we got in the boat and instead of going out of Algonquian, I went around the Maryland side, went across the ferry, White's Ferry, and put in over there. And this gentleman got, he got in the boat, no problem. I looked at him and assumed he was maybe 60, 65, something of that nature. And he had a leather tackle box and a leather fly rod case. Wow. And he got in the boat. I took him upstream near the Dickerson power plant and he started putting together his fly rod and stringing the line. And I looked at the fly rod and I noticed it was split bamboo and the snake guides were held on with plastic electrical tape. And I'm thinking, boy, that's a beat up <laughs> rod. And then he made the first cast and I knew I was in the presence of an expert and told him so. And he told me, he said, well, you know, you get to be pretty good when you've been using the same rod for 50 years. Damn. And I said, 50 years, how old are you? He said, 84. Wow. And uh, in the first 10 minutes, he had a four and a half and a five pound small mouth on the fly rod. We drifted on down the river. He caught a bunch more fly rod and he said, Charlie, are there any large mouth in here? I said, yeah. Down at the intersection just below White's Ferry, there's a, a bunch of lily pads down there that normally hold a decent large mouth or two. He said, can we go down there? I said, sure. As we were drifting down, we passed a farm just above White's Ferry that had a bunch of cattle in it. And he says, boy, that's a nice herd of full-bodied black deer. <laughs> they were black Angus cattle. <laughs> <laughs> and we got down he made two or three casts into those lily pads and pulled out a five pound large mouth. And he said, okay, I'm through. I said, we haven't been fishing more than an hour and a half. He said, Charlie, I like quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not able to stay out here all day. He said, so I've had a great time. He said, and, uh, I'm, I'm going to do an article uh, on the trip. I said, an article? He said, yes, I'm the outdoor editor of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and a former president of the Outdoor Writers Association. Wow. He says, have you ever thought about writing? Mm -hmm. I said, no. He says, you ought to. You tell beautiful stories and you ought to be an outdoor writer. He says, tell you what, you come, all right. I, he says, we will get together next week. Make it Wednesday about noon. I met him Wednesday at noon. He had his typewriter with him. And I told him, I said, you know, I don't know how to write a story. He said, yes, you do. You just don't know it. He said, you see this typewriter? Again, this is before internet now. <laughs> he says, talk to that typewriter as if it was a person. Damn, that's cool. Ah, that's cool. And I did. In the meantime, he wrote an introductory article. He said, now take this to your local newspaper and tell them you'd like to do a fishing column for them. I did. The sports editor loved it. <laughs> he said, let's go with it. And I was on the staff of the rest and times for the next 20 years. But I need before and we got so many people in the comment section here. Brandon says like I need to hear some stories. Um, 
do you have like two or three stories that you'd be willing to tell for everybody? Uh, I probably got two or three hundred. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> ah. One of them I dearly love. I had a woman call me and ask me to book a trip on the Potomac for she and her husband. And she says, I just have one little problem. I said, what's that? She says, I'm nine months pregnant. I said, well, I, we can do it, but you need to understand a couple of things. Once we get on the water, you're an hour away from a hospital. And Charlie doesn't deliver babies. <laughs> she said, that's all right, I'll take the chance. So we put in just below Woodrow Wilson Bridge, put the boat in the water, dropped the trolling motor, and started fishing. And the lagoon just below the marina is just solid grass. Mm. And the uh, hard line of grass at the drop-off was just straight up and down. And if you drop a plastic worm at the edge of the grass, you watch your line stream off, pick up the fish, and drop it in the boat. I probably had 15 or 20 fish. Her husband had 15 or 20 fish. And she didn't catch a fish all day. And I, you know, I tried to work with her and she said, Charlie, my big problem is when I feel that tap tap, I don't know whether it's a fish or the baby kicking. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tremendous day. Another time, a husband and wife combination, we put in a Pohick Bay and ran all the way up uh, to Washington. Once we got up there, we fished in the spoils area and around Woodrow Wilson Bridge, and caught a bunch of largemouth. And then all of a sudden, she mentioned that she really, it was her husband's birthday and it was a birthday present for him, the trip. And she really wanted to get him a striper. Well, the tide was wrong at the time. I said, but we can give it a try. Well, we went over to the bridge, Woodrow Wilson Bridge, and fished the channel, the, uh, the wood barriers on the side of the bridge during the channel. And she came up with a nine pound striper. We couldn't get another one. Wow. <laughs> but she did catch a nine pounder. It was getting late, so we head back to Pohick Bay. And just before we go to the ramp, I knew where there was a submerged barge. So I pulled in there and they were using my equipment. And I said, I, I need you to cast right there. And both of them did. And she's talking to me, paying no attention whatsoever to her rod. And all of a sudden, it almost got jerked out of her hand. <laughs> and she says, oh, I've got a fish. <laughs> and she raises the rod tip. And I said, what I want you to do is take up the slack and set the hook. And she did. And when I saw the bend in the rod, it being my rod, I knew it was a good fish. I said, now I want you to take up the slack again and set the hook again. And I made her set the hook four times. <laughs> and she said, why am I doing this? And I said, you'll see in just about a minute. <laughs> and she got the fish to the side of the boat and it was just over seven pounds. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Wonderful trip. Oh my goodness. All right. Get yeah, we got some time. Okay, what, one more story. One more story. Let one more sure. story. Okay. Had a, uh, <laughs> a professional fisherman book me for a practice day before his tournament. And we put in at Bellhaven Marina just below Woodrow Wilson Bridge. And at that time, the, the, uh, the milfoil was growing all the way out to the channel edge from the marina. 
And I went out to the channel edge and there's one point where the tide just washed by it beautifully. So I pulled out Bagley crankbaits and fished parallel to that point of milfoil. And we had, I don't know, six or seven fish in the two and a half to four pound class. And, it, you know, we continued, we fished other places. At the end of the day, when I took them back to shore, he said, Charlie, if you're fishing the tournament tomorrow, where are you going to fish? I said, that point in Milfoil. You sit there all during the outgoing tide, you're going to catch fish all day long, and they're quality fish. And he said, oh, okay, well, that's what I'll do. Well, the next day I had another client and put in at Bellhaven, and I go over to that point, he's not there. And we're at the best tide. My client that day had 12 fish, including one over six wow. off that point. Uh, that professional fisherman ended in the high 40s in the tournament. <laughs> he never went to that point. That's crazy. And I've, I've had so many people do that. I had another one, a uh, guy who used to write for the journal newspapers. He wanted me to take him out and show him Matawoman Creek. So I did. I took him to one particular spot, and at that one spot, I told him there are always a school of 10 or 11, 11 and a half inch bass here. You can catch 30 or 40 fish here in a day, but you'll be lucky if you ever get a keeper. The next day I had a client out, uh, <laughs> a little boy, probably seven or eight years old, had a 17 pound limit. Wow. On the small crankbaits. The tide got wrong, so we moved on down to fish another spot. And we went by that spot and here's that writer Right on that spot, I asked him how he was doing. He says, well, I probably caught 20 fish, but I can't get a keeper. Duh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is... It proves the old adage you can lead a fish to, or a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. <laughs> that's, that's what's so nice about sometimes an angler is their first time out. They're going to listen. They're going to they're gonna take your uh, advice, and they're going to implement it. Now, do you have another minute? Yeah, I do. Okay. I used to take people out on the Chesapeake Bay on a charter boat. Mm -hmm. And I, I was friends with a bunch of Fairfax County police. And the, the captain asked me to take out a group of officers and their wives and kids. And I said, no problem. So the wives and kids rode with the captain in his tricked out van while the officers rode with me in my uh, Chrysler station wagon. We went down, got aboard the boat. Now on the way down, I told the officers, I said, now, gentlemen, I want you all to understand one thing. I don't want to hear any whining when your wives and kids catch all the fish and you don't catch any. Well, of course, they all bust out laughing. That's never going to happen. <laughs> we go aboard the boat for the first hour and a half. Not a single officer caught a fish while the wives and kids were catching fish hand over fist. Wow. And the lieutenant came to me and said, Charlie, you told us this would happen. How did you know? I said, it's simple. You guys know everything in the world about fishing. The wives and kids don't know anything, and they follow directions. <laughs> I thought you liked that one. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, all right. So we got we got just enough time here because we're gonna have to pack up, guys. Um, is you, you do you have one more story for everyone at home? Just one more. One more story, boy. Hmm. It's tough on the spot. <laughs> it's, 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 
on the spur of the moment to think of things. Oh, okay. Chickahominy River. We were talking about it just a little while ago. <laughs> a, a friend of mine was uh, fishing the BASS circuit. And he decided that he wanted to go down to the Chick to fish just normal fishing. Said, okay, I'll go with you. We went down to the Chick. And he has this fancy ranger bass boat. He has a place that he loves to fish, all cypress trees. And he loves to flip. So he gets right tight up to the cypress trees and he's flipping, catching fish, no problem. Well, at one point, the wind's blowing a little bit and moving the boat around the back end of the boat. This is before <laughs> power poles <laughs> but at one point the back end of the boat swung around close to the trunk of the cypress tree and of course the, the limbs are there and I look at one of the limbs and I see a nice big water snake oh god as big as my arm with about five males wrapped around it it was a the uh, birthing season. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then I look the branch next to it and here's another one with a bunch of snakes. Within my arm's length, there were 30 some snakes. And I turned around and I said, Jim, you know, I don't mind snakes, but 30 of them <laughs> right in my face is a little bit much. <laughs> He turned around and looked at those snakes, and I thought he was going to jump off the boat. <laughs> Charlie, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I appreciate it so much. Guys, again, please go help support um, the, the youth program they have here. Uh, New Horizon Bass Association. It's link in the episode description, as always, to everything that we're talking about here today. We are, we are done with our live stream. If you'd like to go support the show, we are only 20 Patreon supporters away from hitting our first goal. Once we hit 100, which again, we're only 20 away from, Fishing DMV will be set. It'll go on forever. We just need to hit that 100, and we're so close. Like, subscribe to the channel, guys, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. This stream is over. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.